and welcome to the Culture Cast. I'm Chris Stashio, and I am joined by two people who I know are going to have a lot to say about this film we're about to talk about. He put the Father Malone and You've Never Seen. That's our good friend. You've never seen September's own Father Malone. Yay, Gina Davis, y'all. 80s Gina Davis, very specific. And our good friend, he's the host of the Projection Booth podcast. He's the Barney Miller to my fish, the one and only Mike White. I don't work with lightning. <laughs> oh, you should just start saying whatever weird things Michael Richards said in this movie, because at least he wasn't screaming racial epithets, folks. Or I sure was looking for subtitles for this movie. Holy shit. <laughs> <laughs> so on this episode of the culture cast we are like father malone said continuing gina davis in the 80s month for you've never seen september with a film that i had not seen for good reason we're talking about 1985's transylvania 6 5 000. it began as a routine assignment transylvania where is that i don't know it's over there someplace but beneath the surface... Pennsylvania's cute. cute. ...of this happy land. Ah. Terrible secrets ah. lurk in the shadows. Ah. I'm terribly sorry. We thought you were an animal. He is. They are the creatures of the night. Shut up, you lowlife. I am low. I'm low. The curse of the undead. Ah. Tell me you want me to. <laughs> the terror of the full moon. Ah. Oh, yeah. And the monster that science created. Full house. Jeff Goldblum. Mm -hmm. Ed Begley Jr. Hi, ladies. For a good time, call. Transylvania 6 5000. <laughs> it's good, huh? So the film is directed by Rudy DeLuca. It's also written by Rudy DeLuca. It's uh, produced by the Dow Chemical Company. And it's. <laughs> 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 and <laughs> that's a real thing. We got to say it on a podcast and hope to God we never say it again. The film is st the film stars Jeff Goldblum, Ed Begley Jr., Carol Kane, Jeffrey Jones. Jeffrey Jones is in this movie. Gina Davis is also here. Michael Richards is here. This is not UHF, but Michael Richards is here. And also one Mr. Joseph Baloney, <laughs> or I'm Bo sure as he got called Bologna. in the industry a lot. Joey Bologna. Yeah, Bologna. I know. Come on. Come on, man. It's the cheap and Donald Gibb, though you would never know it was Donald Gibb under all that hair. I know. Who was fantastic in it, actually. I thought he was the best part of the movie. So, Father Malone. Yeah. We have an uphill battle here uh, on this episode. Uh, but tell me a little bit about why, in God's name, you picked this movie. And I'm sure you're going to tell us all about when you saw it when it was in theaters, because there's no other way you could defend this movie. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm actually not going to defend the movie. I was programming Gina <laughs> Davis' movie. No, no, no. I mean, I, I, look, I do like it. I, I obviously like it more than you, but, uh, I, I don't recognize it as a grand masterpiece of cinema. And, uh, as far as seeing it for the first time, I think I didn't see it in the theater. This was on, I'm sure, HBO on a loop in the, uh, mid 80s. So I probably saw it a lot. And what's funny is, uh, now having rewatched it, I think I've only watched about the first half a half a dozen times because I had no recollection of how the movie ended. Um, and weird. It, I watched the movie earlier today, and I don't either. Yeah, it's a it's a it's a puzzler. <laughs> but yeah, it's a real gas and a half. But you know, you had to tell me it was you've never seen September. Is that, is that the month we're in now? And uh, true. Uh, so I thought, well, actually, nobody's seen Transylvania Six Five Thousand. I assume Mike has. But uh, no, I've never seen this. Oh movie. my god, things are coming up. Millhouse, us both. I was kind of glad that I hadn't seen this movie. <laughs> hey, uh, so, Father Malone, you actually stumped us both. So, do you want the big teddy bear or do you want the attache case? Attache case have every time between yeah. the erasers, <laughs> not including the t-shirts below the gum. Anything in this? three inch area right here <laughs> they got some of those finger traps yeah do you want me to continue to defend the movie i'm not going to <laughs> <laughs> i want you to yeah what i mean um, i'm curious what did you think of the movie watching it i like it for i think the reason i liked it to begin with it in that it is one of the most likable casts i've ever seen in a movie um every single one of these actors i i, I enjoy in one way or another um and particularly john biner who 
was like a stand-up comedian and impressionist. He played uh, he played the Igor character, the Carol Kane's husband. Um, and he had a TV show. I think it was on Showtime in the early '80s called yep. Bizarre, uh, which was the uh, where we got uh, Super Dave from. Yeah, Su- Super Dave, exactly. So um, I was actually a big fan of John Biner, and I think he's really good in the movie. So that probably increased the rewatchability. Also increasing the rewatchability is Gina Davis as a sexy vampire. You, as much as you don't like this movie. You have to admit the scenes she's in are pretty great. <laughs> if I can be a total pig about it. <laughs> of which I was about to say, that is kind of the only thing you can say. And being a total pig about it is the only thing that you can get away with, as far as I'm concerned. Pretty much. What about you, Mike White? What did you think <sighs> of this cinematic masterpiece brought to you by the Dow Chemical Company? You know, I don't know why I had never seen this. Um... I mean, it's a horror comedy. It does have a fantastic cast. Uh, I like, especially Gina Davis and Jeff Goldblum. I like them so much. Uh, I really like Carol Kane. I wasn't that big of a Biner fan when he was around. Um, But for whatever reason, I had never seen this. And then while I was watching it, I realized why I had never seen this. This movie is not good at all. It's really <laughs> awful. And then looking at Rudy DeLuca's filmography, it's like, I mean, I absolutely love a lot of uh, Mel Brooks stuff. But when it comes to the things that I don't necessarily like about Mel Brooks, like I, I like silent movie. I think I might be in the minority there. Once you get into high anxiety, he starts to fall apart. And when you get into like life stinks and Dracula didn't loving it. I mean, those, those are, those are, are garbage. The worst movies. <laughs> oh, they're hot garbage. And he's all the way in. He's totally invested when it comes to those movies. And I'm like, Oh, okay. So basically he helped drag, uh, Mel Brooks down into the lower depths. And it's just, it's not good. I mean, he did work on pink lady, which was a fantastic TV show, but yeah, this was this was an awful, awful movie. Just not funny at all. I didn't understand. Wait, wait, are you saying it's bad? Is that it's what you're really saying? bad? I just didn't understand. Like, I didn't understand anybody's motivation. Like, the whole reason why they go to Transylvania and why Jeff Goldblum hated Ed Begley Jr. from the outset, and that he's just so mean to Ed Begley Jr. the whole time. And it makes <laughs> Jeff Goldblum completely unlikable because he's just a dick the whole time. And I'm like, okay, what, what am I getting out of this? So this was a miserable watch. Can I, can I just say that I, I liked how mean Jeff Goldblum was to Ed Begley Jr.? It's like a Ren and Stimpy situation. I mean, had, had Ed Begley been like worse, I guess. And then he seems to be paying for his sins because of the Michael Richards scenes. What the fuck was Michael Richards doing in this movie? He it, just this bizarre. I think he drank from the fire hose one oh. too many times. My <laughs> God, I did have to look up this. This was post uh, Dow Chemical disaster over in India. This came out a year later. So yeah, this was Dow Chemical trying to free up some money. What was it? They had to make this in Yugoslavia so they could free up some money that they had stashed over in Europe because they were hurting so bad because they had poisoned so many people in India. Well, you know what they say in 2020 America, if they're not white, it doesn't matter. (laughs) Is uh, is that not what they... I I was watching the news. Chris, all lives matter. (laughs) Oh, oh, oh. oh. Don't bring your fucking politics on my podcast. (laughs) (laughs) You keep your politics on your podcast, sir. (laughs) Because you know what? If you put politics on my podcast, people will stop listening to me like they've stopped listening to you. Don't you get it? (laughs) That's true. That's true. Sorry to go on another rant. No, no, no. Polemics just coming out. (laughs) No, it's fine. Um, This movie is absolutely awful. Uh, (laughs) I... (laughs) What I don't understand is... Father Malone, I'm so sorry. Um, I'm not because you didn't make this, uh, and you know oh, what? You're not offending me by not liking this movie. I, I just think it's hilarious that I found a movie that you've both never seen, and it's probably the worst movie this month. Oh, definitely the worst movie this month. All the others are pretty solid. Um, that just tickles well, me. If, sorry. If you're comparing it to Fletch, yeah. 
<laughs> yeah. You're gonna I mean, the bar is pretty low, right? Yeah, the bar is quite low with Fletch. Not a good movie at all. <laughs> I'm just saying that the bar is low with this one, because it's like, if if this is the worst movie of the month, I mean, that's pretty easy to see. You know, everything else has to be better than this. Yeah, it's what's weird about this movie is you you hit on something, Father Malone, that I would completely agree with. This movie has a good cast. Yeah. And that is where it stops and starts. That's it's, true. I, they're, I, given no, they're given nothing to do. It's a fucking shame, frankly. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, uh, I, you know what? I'm going to I'm gonna defend one thing, which is sort of midway through the movie when they're trying to break Ed Begley in and out of the sanitarium. I thought that was really funny. The prisoner getting out, prisoner getting out, and that's how they get him in. And then prison, you know, someone trying to sneak in, so they throw him out. I thought that was clever. And also, Ed Begley is hesitant to climb the fence because he thinks it's electrified. And then Jeff Goldblum takes Ed Begley's hand and just puts it on to see if it is. But before he does that, he takes out a handkerchief just to make sure he wouldn't be electrocuted as well, which I thought was a nice detail, and it made me laugh when I saw it. But, you know, maybe that's – I'm just more st- sadistic or something. No, I think you had one more laugh than either one of us did. Wow, that's a shame. You guys didn't, like, I didn't, laugh – I didn't – You didn't laugh out loud when laugh. you saw the model train at the beginning during the credit sequence? <laughs> no, I didn't laugh at all because I just – I don't understand what the point of this movie was because they don't seem to be going in the horror angle. And if they have made a conscious and sincere attempt to be funny – then Rudy DeLuca has no idea what it means to write a humorous script that actually has comedy timing. Because there's nothing to to laugh at in this movie. I am curious to know if he had written the script prior to Dow Chemical suddenly saying, hey, we need a movie. Because it's, you know, very specifically set in Transylvania, and they knew they had to shoot in Yugoslavia. So I'm curious if uh, what the the chicken and the egg thing there was. That's a good question. I... I don't know. I wouldn't be surprised if they just had this script kind of lying around and then suddenly were able to get it out of turnaround by having him, uh, you know, so somebody from Dow saying, hey, we need uh, we need something that's set in Eastern Europe. And then they just send the I word. I also don't know what percentage of uh, cast members they had to employ <clears throat> from Yugoslavia to make it a Yugoslavian film. Because there are a lot of folks in this movie that are clearly Yugoslavian actors. Oh, yeah. Like Jeffrey Jones? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Jeffrey Jones, known Yugoslavian, among other okay. things. Um, it makes me cringe every time he's on screen. It does, which is a shame, because I used to like him so much. And he gives such good performances so often. I mean, he was what? He was in that Ravenous film, right? With Guy Pierce. He sure was. He was great in that. Yeah. He's just been, he's almost always so good in everything that he's in. And yeah, now you see him and you're just like, oh man, when did it start? Do you have dirty yeah. pictures of little kids <laughs> right now? This is not good. <laughs> Transylvania 6 5000. Fuck this podcast. We're, <laughs> the, the, this is like Dante's descent into the fucking nine circle of hell. Just everything about this movie has its own problems, from the fact that Jeffrey Jones, Jones is in it to the fact that Dow Chemical Company fucking produced the film on the backs of, you know, God knows what kind of exploit, exploitative bullshit that they were pulling in Yugoslavia. Um, Speaking of Jeff, Jeffrey Jones for one second, to think that, like, he had done one other movie before this movie, and that was Amadeus. So he went from that to right. this. <laughs> Uh, well, he's probably still over in Europe at the time. He's just like, oh, yeah, sure. Give it to me. I'll do it. That's I'm entirely likely, like. yeah. And then Carol Kane's in this movie? She's great. Yeah. Come on. She's really good. I mean, she's great, but again, in a She vacuum. doesn't have anything to do. <laughs> in I a mean, vacuum. neither she, – she and Biner are just like – you know, I, I read in the trivia where it's just like they had one line of things to do and they just improvise, and I'm like – Okay, yeah, I can really see that because who knows what the fuck they're doing? <laughs> I'm not sure Carol Kane knows. The whole thing with the window washing. I mean, it's just, it's not funny. Yeah. I, I, uh... It feels like people watched m- comedy films from like the 40s and 50s and tried to emulate it. And they don't know how or what made those films like, you know, Abbott and Costello meet the mummy. They don't understand what made that funny. 
Because that kind right. of feels like what they're going for here, where it's like, oh, it's actually set in Yugoslavia, so it does have that old world Eastern European charm to it, and you have a, a fairly like reputable, well known cast, and then it's like you just have no idea how to capture what made those movies funny, or what makes movies funny, or comedy in general. The first laugh between two cavemen is literally passed over by Rudy DeLuca because he has no idea how to write comedy at all. I don't get it. I genuinely don't oh, yeah. have any idea. <laughs> well, he, he co-wrote uh, Caveman with Ringo Starr. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Ugh. Yeah, I it, it, I mean, DeLuca would have been familiar with young Frankenstein, you know, having... I'm sure he was. ...in the comedy business. He would have known that movie and should have emulated that more. But it was just weird, this whole, like, mad monster party of we're going to have a Frankenstein, a Wolfman, a vampire, and just, yeah, it, it did feel very Abbott and Costello. This did feel kind of like you know, brain donors where we're going to take like old comedy stuff and try to do it in a more modern era. But, and I guess to your point, you know, the whole relationship of, of Goldblum and Begley is very similar to how, uh, Abbott would always pick on Costello or Laurel and Hardy. I can't remember who was who or Laurel and Hardy, but it just, it never comes together. And like, the the whole hitting on um the the uh, Elizabeth Elson character and how she's got the little girl and I'm like okay that plays into the Frankenstein thing so it's like there are ideas in here but they're just they never get executed uh, the one thing that the only time and and Chris you were talking about laughs the only time I laughed was there's this horrible horrible ADR on Teresa Ganzel later on in the film, right towards the end, she has one of the most distinctive voices in the world. And suddenly there's another woman's voice coming out of her mouth for a few lines. And I'm just like, what the fuck is happening here? <laughs> <laughs> that was the only time I laughed. Well, it's better than me, which was a, a big negative. No, not a single one. Well, that's just because you have no heart. No, it's because <laughs> I don't understand what they were going for with this film. Nevertheless, the movie is genuinely hysterical. No. No, it's not. No, no it's not. No. Uh, I, I, <laughs> what? No. God in heaven. Don't watch I mean, this movie to find out if he's lying or not. I am I I am completely behind you, Mr. Wallace. Or sorry, Father Malone. When it comes to the whole Adet, the sexy vampire thing. Uh-huh. I was 100% on board for that. The the poster image that uh, uh, Plex decided to pull up was her kind of hovering over Ed Begley Jr. when he's tied up at one point. And I was like, okay, yeah, yeah, I, I can get into this movie. But she doesn't show up for like half an hour or more, and she's hardly on screen. And I was just like, no, 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 M- more of her. I want more of her in this movie. I would like I would like more of her. She doesn't have to wear that outfit a hundred percent of the time, but I definitely want to see more of her in this film. Well, because it, let's not forget she's in this movie for one reason and one reason alone, and it's because of the outfit that she's wearing, which she wears well. And let me just yeah, defend, I mean, that, let me defend myself here for I'm a minute, disputing. gents. I'm not disputing that, but the problem is, is that they definitely overlooked what made Gina Davis good. And, um, I mean, they didn't overlook it, but they focused on the wrong thing. Oh, I wouldn't call it the wrong thing. I would just call it a, oh like, an, e- an equally, an equally admirable thing. I, basically, let me just say that this particular selection was brought to you by 13 year old me. <laughs> <laughs> Your thir- th- I would hope that 13-year-old you liked comedy and not what's the cinematic equivalent of a bag of rats being smashed against a wall. Well, yeah, man. I mean, I don't consider myself humorless. I don't think this is a fair uh, judgment of my level of humor. Uh, I- I- I'm just <laughs> no, saying... No, I would agree 100%. 100% with you. Look, there's going to be some clunkers this month, guys, okay? This is the only one? <laughs> This is the only one, because the other three I've seen, and then the only other one is a movie that has Jeff Goldblum dressed up in a fur suit. See, that's that's what I'm that's what I'm getting at. I, I might be softening you up so you like that movie more <laughs> than you might otherwise, uh, because that particular movie I adore. I genuinely remember liking Earth Girls Are Easy. I haven't seen it in a long time, but I definitely, in retrospect, like it more than this one. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, this one, it just, it's what's weird about this movie is it, it, like, 
I almost don't even remember what happened in the movie. And you just watched it. And I just watched... No. (laughs) Okay. No, I did not. I watched it earlier today. Um, It is... I I watched it at, like, 2 in the afternoon, okay? And, like, I I can't remember it, like, six hours later. That's the sign of, um, you know, a a great film, I think. If you can't remember it at all. Like, like you already (laughs) mentioned, Mike, like, what was... What was... What in the holy hell was Michael Richards doing in this movie? Like, I have no idea, right? None. What his actual character was meant to be doing. Didn't uh, Rudy DeLuca work with him on Fridays? I think that that might be the connection there. Clearly, Rudy DeLuca thought everything Michael Richards was doing was fucking hilarious and didn't realize it was just grinding whatever little momentum the movie was able to achieve into the ground. And that every time that phone rings, we go for the same gag, that hilarious gag that was made... What, how many decades before by a Warner Brothers cartoon, by a Bugs Bunny cartoon? But yet, we're going to. This is a funny gag that is called Transylvania 6 5000, and we're going to play the song all the way through to that line every single time the phone rings. It's not funny the first time, it's not funny the second time, and it's sure not funny the third time. And what the fuck, guys? You know? <laughs> it, it was just so frustrating. It's like there could have been something here. Maybe, but it just, it, it it was so poorly executed and poorly done. Oh, it was, it was frustrating. What's weird about the title is in the opening of the film, when Norman Fell is sending them off to Transylvania, he yells down, I want a, a headline next week, Frankenstein lives. And then it cuts to the title card, which is Transylvania 65000. So again, I'm wondering, was the original title Frankenstein lives? And then somebody else thought, oh, let's make a hilarious pun on a song from the 1940s. Right. And, you know, there's, again, going back to Young Frankenstein, there's that line, pardon me, boys, this is the Transylvania station. Yeah, yeah, track 29. Do you want, hey, mister, should I give you shine? You know, that's funny. That's fucking funny, but this is not funny. And then the other thing, kind of to your point, uh, Father Malone, is the whole idea of every time they talk about Frankenstein, they keep saying, like, Frankenstein must be destroyed. And I'm like, okay, yeah, are we playing off of the hammer stuff? But they just, they never come to it. And, like, there's even a part where he says Frankenstein must be destroyed, and I swear everybody, like, pauses for a second before they go on with the rest of the film. Yeah. You know what's uh, also unusual about this particular movie? But this is something I do enjoy about it. Uh, their Frankenstein is clearly on, uh, has uh, platform boots on to make him larger. And yet every member of the cast seems to be taller than him. Well, every many, it's member a cast of, cast of giants. At least our three leads are giants. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> like I mean, six, well, five. I Freddy DeLuca claims on the commentary for the film that this is the largest cast he'd ever worked with. Well, there's a commentary for this. Oh. I should have bought the Blu-ray. <laughs> <laughs> The, hey, but here's the thing, Mike. Do you want to know who released the film last year on Blu-ray? Uh, is it Kino Lorber? It sure is. Wow. Holy cow. And they didn't ask me to do a commentary track for this? I would love to hear that commentary. <laughs> this movie is... <laughs> oh, another Mike joke that does not work. Also, why did Mike become Gilbert Gottfried? <laughs> for like no that? reason. <laughs> it's it's bizarre to me that this movie has a Blu-ray release. <laughs> On by Kino fucking Lorber. <laughs> I mean, we talked about it on that Patreon episode for Don that um, you know the movies that are getting Criterion Collection releases are uh, their their quality is tenuous at best. And uh, boy, I don't know what Kino Lorber was smoking, but if you guys want to send some of that my way, I'd love to find out what you're seeing. Jeff Goldblum, that's what they're saying. He's very hot right now. Hmm. But is this even a Jeff Goldblum quality performance? It's not very good, no. No, like it's it takes it doesn't play into the things that make Jeff Goldblum a good actor, which is his quirky nature. And the characters that he plays are always very standout characters because they play to Jeff Goldblum's strengths as an actor. And this movie it's like turn the one lovable guy into a total dickhead. And it's like why uh, you know what? would you do that? I, I, I agree that the character's a total dickhead, but I think uh, seeing Jeff Goldblum play exasperated for the length of a film was kind of refreshing instead of all the sort of bundle of quirks we're now used to from him. Yeah, but the problem is Ed Begley Jr. plays the dickhead better than Jeff Goldblum ever could. Think about oh, that episode clearly. that we did for Tales from the Crypt. 
Oh, yeah, where man. Where he played the perfect dickhead. And it was perfect. And he yes. played it perfectly. And yet, in this film, they make him the bumbling sidekick. That's true. I mean, reversing the roles could have uh, could have uh, done wonders because we would feel that much more for Jeff Goldblum as put upon. But I just don't think it would change the fact that this movie's not funny, right? Oh, no. I mean, no, ultimately it wouldn't help at all. I'm just saying it would be interesting. I feel very bad. I didn't realize that there was a script available uh, for this out there. I could have oh, God damn. bought this and read this, and I would have been able to also tell you that this was co-written at one point by Dennis Feldman, who apparently either had his name removed or lost arbitration. Yeah, Rudy DeLuca fought for, fought for the sole credit on this one. <laughs> yeah, the same Dennis Feldman who uh, wrote just one of the guys and The Golden Child. Oh my god, that's quite an yeah. output. <laughs> <laughs> and he also wrote Species and Virus, so... You know, he he was hitting them. Here's my memory of the movie Species. Sitting in the tra- in the theater, and the trailer had played, and they said Species, and some guy behind me went, "Rhymes with feces." And now that's that movie for me forever. Thank you, random cinema goer. <laughs> you ruined it. my life. I can't watch Species one through six. <laughs> uh, I am going to be doing an episode on just one of the guys one of these days. So now I got to find Dennis Feldman and ask him about Transylvania six five thousand. And you know what, what he'll do? He may just be like, and I wanted to ask you, Mr. Feldman, about uh, Transylvania 6. Click. <laughs> he, just, <laughs> he just hangs up on it. He's like, I am not talking about this film with you or anyone for that matter. <laughs> uh, I didn't understand something about this movie. Are the monsters... Just mo- one thing? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, just the one singular problem. Okay. Um, all right. Whew. Were the monsters monsters? Not at all. No. No, none of them were really monsters. It's like a Scooby-Doo episode. She had fake teeth. The werewolf had the overproduction of hair follicles. And the Frankenstein... I still don't understand what the Frankenstein was. It was some sort of bad plastic surgery? It was a guy in a car accident, and uh, he was much, much worse. And this is the best that the plastic surgeon could get him into, which just so happened to look like uh, Frankenstein. Okay. Yeah, good, sure. Good stuff. <laughs> <laughs> uh, a, those are some quality plot holes that you just filled in for us. Well, I'm just here to help, to guide you through. <laughs> I, uh, <laughs> I, I, I get why they did what they did with the monsters, making them. Oh, they're not monsters. You know, they're just people like you and me. You didn't have to reveal that they weren't monsters to do that, though. You could have just made them monsters and just, you know, tran- and just the whole joke of the movie is. Transylvania is nothing like the movies where they burn the monsters at the stake. That could right. have been the whole joke of the like the last bit of the movie. And instead it's like, no, no, they're not monsters. Because that's the only way people will love them in this town is if they're just people, not monsters. What, what? That would have solved it. I kind you of know what, so- Father Malone? <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> <laughs> Listen here. Father chuckle fuck, as you want to be. <laughs> that is me. <laughs> Sorry. I mean, if you're going to call me chuckle fuck. Don't forget, I'm ordained. I was kind of hoping for more about the newspaper. Like, there's this whole thing of, you know, Goldblum knows that he the the newspaper is below him. He is he wants to write for Time Magazine, but I was hoping like we would explore that a little bit more, and it would be more like a Weekly World News kind of a thing. Or there was that uh, TV show called The Chronicle where they would investigate stuff. Like, it'd be like <laughs> you know, hey, Bat Boy. And then they would go and find that there really was a Bat Boy. And yeah, I, there was nothing. Like, once Norman Fell was out of the movie at the beginning, he was out of the movie completely. I see what you're saying. Yeah, I mean, Father Malone. No, no, I I, I agree with that. I mean, I think uh, it was probably counterproductive to the plot to have a character who's unwilling to do this because it's below him. I I I was watching that the scene with Norman Fell, and he's protesting, like, you know, I want to write for the New York Times, and I I was unclear as to why Norman Fell didn't just say, "Look at any of the headlines around us. Where do you think you are? Hit the bricks if you don't want to like report on this stuff." Um. But having them be more of into that sort of investigative journalism uh, for like a weekly world news level would have been probably helpful. Mm-hmm. I don't. I don't know that the movie can necessarily be redeemed, but uh, <laughs> it certainly couldn't well, have been worse. And I, don't I guess think it can be redeemed because this is one of the few movies that I have watched for this podcast where the problem is twofold. 
it's not just the direction, it's also the script. And if you've got a script that's awful, which I'm not going to spend money to find out if it is, because it's probably pretty close to what's on screen. You don't want to see it in high definition? I would assume this script is really poorly written. Yes. (laughs) Yes. I don't know what else to say. I mean, it's just, it's... This is this movie I think is just a really bad example of what happens when you don't understand what you're trying to make and you make something wholly just kind of unfunny and unable to really capture cuz I mean they're going for something here. They're going for like a a style of movie that's, you know, it could have I don't know how it could have worked I guess because horror comedies are really hard to do. Yeah. Er- earlier, Mike, you mentioned how uh, he, uh, Rudy DeLuca, didn't learn anything from Young Frankenstein. And I agree with that because I think ultimately we should have had the, you know, the different stories playing out and these characters involved in it rather than this investigative thing that didn't mean anything at all. Like, let's see a Dracula story that they're sort of mixed up in and a mummy story and a Frankenstein story. And then it could have been funny. It would have had at least some potential for laughs. The, the mummy, the girl, the Yugoslav girl at the end, when they're unwrapping her, like, remember her? She was ugly. Now she's gorgeous. Sh- she and John Biner actually got married after this movie. Huh. So he cheated on Carol Kane, is what you're saying? Apparently. but So you're saying that this, that wasn't real? She wasn't actually a mummy? <laughs> this is a movie? Yeah, that's what I, I'm saying. I, it's a shame, honestly, because the funny thing, Father Malone. <laughs> I, I had this movie on my Plex server for the longest time. And then I actually deleted it, and I had to put it back on there to watch it for this. And I was like, oh, this could be kind of a fun lark. Nope. And I I got it confused for Dead Heat, which is funny, because maybe that movie might actually be good. No, I like that movie. No, that's not a good movie. (laughs) I like it a lot. Is that Treat Williams and Joe Piscopo, right? Yep. I mean, it sounds like it could be fun. But, I mean, here's the thing. If you tell someone the cast of this movie and what this movie's about... It sounds like it could be fun. You know, Jeff oh, Goldblum yeah. and Universal Monsters. And it's like, it is none of those things, and yet all of them at the same time, but not in the way that you thought. Because the Universal Monsters are there, but they're just, they're not monsters, guys. Well, they're just people. Here's what I'll say about this movie, just to sort of sum up my feelings. Gina Davis, dressed as a vampire. You're both picturing her right now. So the movie has some merit. Thank you. <laughs> so on that note special note from father malone uh what is that like is that like jerry springer's corner at the end of the show yeah give us give us a moral (laughs) the moral of the story is don't let the guy who worked with mel brooks be the guy who makes your movie (laughs) yeah let mel brooks make your movie (laughs) hey in in fairness he was the best guy dow chemical could get for their for for first foray (laughs) into filmmaking (laughs) Also, another moral of the story, don't work with a morally bankrupt company. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, boy. Because, you know, it's not money laundering, but kind of. Kind of. Kind of. What would you give the film out of five, Mike White? Uh, How low can you go? A zero. Zero. Father Malone. I'll give it a two. Don't be cheeky and give it a two. Two for Gina Davis. Uh, (laughs) Such is my adoration. Son of a bitch. <laughs> oh, man. Uh, as for me, I'm going to give it a zero. Oh, boy. It's not, it's, wow. It's it's so bad. Not, it's bad. Not one performance in that movie was any good. Even if they're good, they're still in this movie, and that's the problem. Yeah, but, you know, that it that should kick it up to at least a one. It should, but there weren't there weren't any performances. The problem is, is all the bad performances weighed against the good ones. Like, all I have to say is Michael Richards is the reason this movie's at a zero. All right. And see, you can't fight me on that. No, man. It, look, uh, yes, it is, a, it is a waste of time to watch the movie. But if you're maybe interested in these people at an early part of their lives and careers, I think, you know, they're, they're doing good work. That's all. If you're interested to see what Yugoslavia looked like in 1985... Yeah, you know, and, you know, I don't know. I don't. I, I agree this is a bad movie. I'm just saying it's not worthless. So on that note, this movie was, you know, uh, this movie was a, it was a time for all three of us. It definitely was a weird and interesting movie experience for everyone. But let's take a break and we'll play a preview for the film I bet the three of us wished we had watched this week on the Culture Cast. I think you're making a mistake. I think you really want to talk to me. 
Sorry, I have three other interviews to do before this party's over. Yeah, but they're not working on something that'll change the world as we know it. They say they are. Yeah, but they're lying. There is a limit, even to the imagination. Human teleportation, molecular decimation, breakdown, and reformation is inherently purging. Where our greatest creations meet our deepest fears. Something went wrong, Seth. When you went through, something went wrong. You are about to go beyond that limit. weird hairs that were growing out of your back I, I had them analyzed but they were definitely not human if you saw how scared and angry and desperate he is I'm sure Typhoid Mary was a very nice person too when you saw her socially no you're afraid to be destroyed and recreated aren't you you're changing Seth everything about you is changing oh no what's happening to me am I dying I want to know what's going on what does the disease want? It wants to turn me into something else. Oh, no. A fly got into the transmitter pod with me that first time when I was alone. Don't go back to it. It could be contagious. Uh, I'm afraid! Don't be afraid! No. Be afraid. Be very afraid. That's right, in the next episode, we're going to be talking about a movie that has Jeff Goldblum and Gina Davis in it, and it's actually really good. We're talking about The Fly. Like I said, I bet we all wish we were watching that movie. <laughs> yeah, not- I watched it like two nights ago. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh-huh. To wash the taste of this movie out of your mouth, I hope. <laughs> oh, man. And on that episode, I will be joined by our good friend, the one and only. Someday I'll get him and Mike on the same podcast, because we've done it before. Big Rich Haddam from the West Coast is going to be joining me to talk about The Fly, along with Akron's own Maggie the Odd. Until then, where can people find you, Mike White? You can find me over at the Projection Booth Podcast, which is available, oddly enough, at projectionboothpodcast.com. And you can find Chris and I talking about the life and times of Captain Bernie Miller at maybe barneymillerpodcast.com. If you Google it, you'll find it. And also, you can find the three of us talking about Twilight Zone 1985 at Dreams for Sale. What about you, Father Malone? Well, as the uh, as uh, Mike just mentioned, you can hear me with these two guys uh, on Dreams for Sale. You can also hear me on Chronicles from the Crypt, the uh, podcast about the HBO television series with uh, Chris here. We, we do that together. Uh, oh, and my YouTube channel. My YouTube channel. So uh, this week, you guys keep your smart remarks to yourself. You've never seen at Ot5 Films. O U G H T F I V E F I L M S. But theoretically, <laughs> yeah. Uh-huh. Just fo- follow this line of thinking here. No. Say I were to rebuking you theory, right now. Yeah. Have seen the movie you're talking about? Yes. Should I still watch your YouTube? Yes, absolutely. But should I then, if I have seen said film, tell you I have seen it? That is uh, apparently the preferred way people get in touch with me. So uh, I wouldn't say you'd be wrong in doing that. Fair. As for me, you can find me on Twitter at Casualty underscore Chris. Mike and Father Malone already mentioned a lot of the stuff that we work on, the three of us together. I also work on the Scary Stories We Tell podcast where we talk about True Crime, The Unexplained, and The Paranormal. And uh, I do that uh, podcast with Jess Byard. Her and I also do another podcast called The One Season Show, where we talk about television shows that only lasted one season. As for this podcast, CultureCast.com, at CultureCast on Twitter, and CultureCast on Instagram. Big thanks, as always, to these two guys for joining me, and to Father Malone for programming the month. And we'll catch you on the next episode.